creativity isn't something that I, you know, I, I look at as a, um, you know, you have to be this wild and crazy artist. Um, for me, there's, there, there, there's, a, there's a, a real sort of mechanical problem solving aspect to it that resonates with me. It's kind of started for me um, at, you know, I, I mean, at school I, I was a terrible student, um, horrible. I was interested in sports and, and film and music and um, girls, but, but never really into academics. But, but art was a big thing for me and I loved literature and I loved English, I loved language. And, and I had an incredible art teacher who, um, her name was Miss Juban. She was, I suppose, the first sort of real influence um, and mentor for me. Um, and she kind of taught me about self-expression in a way that was incredibly liberating and incredibly empowering. And, you know, I, I, think, I think from an early age, I just knew that somehow I needed to be involved in telling stories, in self-expression and creativity. Um, so, so it started for me there and I, I sort of, you know, I wanted to go to study um, architecture. But there was something a little too um, sort of scientific about that. So I thought I'd give advertising a go or graphic design a go. And I studied at the AAA School of Advertising here in Cape Town. And again, I had another great mentor there, my lecturer. And, and um, you know, I had an amazing class, a great, great class. So a lot of the people that I went into AAA with are now sort of leaders of the, of the industry. It's actually quite, it's quite incredible just to think about how many people were with me at that time at college who are now, you know, incredibly successful locally abroad. Um, and, and then I got um, offered a job um, at the Jupiter Drawing Room Cave Town in its first year of, of opening. So Ross Charles um, offered me a job um, about four months before I graduated. And it was tiny, you know, back then that, that Jupiter was, I think, 12 people or 11 people. Um, and um, Ross was an incredible mentor to me and he taught me about advertising. So that's where I kind of really got my, my, my education. Um, and he was an incredibly liberating creative director to work under, who kind of, he kind of gave you free reign just to kind of fail and to explore and to do your thing. Um, and we had some, you know, terrific clients, like the Musica client at the time was a very vibrant client for us and a very important client for us because they also, you know, they were also, um, uh, you know, trying to, to kind of figure out how to create a brand with very little budget. So a lot of the work that we did was very low-fi, very low-key, so the ideas had to be sharp, the, concept, the concepts had to be very, very focused um, when, when you don't have big production like budget. So, that kind of account and um, that time taught me a hell of a lot. Um, and I still use that sort of lo-fi thinking in, in, in every single day um, of, of my career. Um, I just think that the luxury of big budgets and big studios with lots of resources allows you to kind of get a little bit sort of lazy. And I like it lean and I like it focused and I like, and I like the simplicity. The simplicity, constraints bring simplicity, you know. So, so that was, so that's how I kind of got into the business and I spent nine years at, at the Jupiter Drawing Room working with some amazing people with a great culture and um, it kind of, that kind of gave me my sort of launch pad to, to go abroad. Um, you know, it's so important to, to fuck up. It's so important to get it wrong. It's so important to really try something and, and want it to work and for it to fail because that's when you learn. That's when you know what to do next time. Um, and I also think that, that you know, I mean, the, the Wyden and Kennedy um, sort of mantra is fail hard. And that's something that's resonated with me for, forever. It's like, if you're gonna fuck up, like fuck up big. Like don't fuck up small. Try and be ambitious, try and do something big. Try and bite off more than you can chew. Um, and if you fail, well at least you've kind of tried to do something big and out of the ordinary. Um, so, so, so I think, you know, and I think Ross kind of gave, gave us that confidence and gave us that leverage to do that. And the truth is, is that I think if you entrust people and you give them, you give them the rope, they, they will appreciate that and work harder and focus harder and feel that there's a responsibility on, on, on them to not disappoint. 
Um, so, you know, I, I mean, creative people are precious, right? We like to hold on to ideas. Uh, we like to kind of, you know, um, keep things very close to our chest. Um, and, and he was a great mentor in trying to, you know, get ideas out there and, and allow, allow for people to express themselves um, and, and to not be precious about ideas. Because the truth is, is that I think, you know, um, if you're tr truly creative and you truly back, back yourself in this industry, you know, you, you, you'll have lots of other ideas. So if one idea fails, it doesn't matter. You've got another one tomorrow or, or that evening. And I think that's the important thing, you know. There's always, there's always more ideas. So my, my international uh, journey um, started at Saatchi and Saatchi London, um, which was you know, a very iconic agency, 80 Charlotte Street is one of the most famous addresses in London. And um, um, Tony Granger um, approached me and um, you know, he, was, he had just arrived at Saatchi's in London after being at Bozell, I think it was, in New York. And so he was trying to get things going. And this was right after Droga had left Saatchi to go to Publicis and they were sort of agency of the year with Droga. So the, the agency had this incredible reputation and now Tony was in and he had to start getting things going. Quite a tough act to follow. And, um, and you know, there were, a, there were a couple of Antipodeans there and there were a couple of um, Brits there and it was interesting times. I think, I think it was, you know, for, for, for me that was um, an education in, in of itself. I had to relearn and, and rethink my, my entire process because the way that we worked in South Africa is that you kind of did everything. You typeset, as an art director, you typeset everything. You were so hands-on um, in terms of producing and making. Um, whereas when I got to London, all of a sudden there was like a big typography department and your, the producers and art buyers were weren't just people who picked up the phone and booked the photographer that you wanted to work with. They were part of the process. So all of a sudden you had this big agency with all these resources and the, the art buyers and producers and typographers were part of the creative process. So your job was really about direction and your job was really about researching, cracking the idea, crafting the idea um, and then working with uh, production uh, and, and typographers and illustrators and, and photographers to, to realize the ideas that you had cracked. So, you know, there was, there was a big sort of like learning curve there. Um, all of a sudden these budgets were a lot bigger. I was able to work with some of the directors that I had sort of dreamed about working with, photographers that you had only hoped to have a conversation with were now suddenly in your office and you were collaborating with them. And you know, I spent five years at Saatchi's in, in London and got to travel and got to um, really sort of immerse myself in the British culture. You know, I grew up South Africa back in the day. You know, you kind of grew up looking at America or you're looking at Europe. And and for me, DNA D was my Bible. That was that was the, the the book that I used to keep next to my, my you know my bed, and I used to study that that stuff all the time. And and it still is a very British award. So to be able to rub shoulders and to be able to immerse myself in that industry um, was just incredible for me. It was like going to Disneyland. So I kind of sucked everything up and I kind of became a sponge and, I, and, um, and it, you know, it was just, it was terrific. It was really, really cool. Um, got to meet lots of amazing people, got to work on you know, amazing brands, amazing projects. Some of the campaigns that I got to work on uh, were, so there was, um, NSPCC is a, a NGO, so it's a child abuse NGO. They've done iconic work for, I don't know, for the last sort of 10, 15 years. Um, and I got to work with um, the guys that did Honda Gur, Smith & Folks. We did a beautiful animation piece for NSPCC, which was very highly awarded. Um, we pitched on Dewar's Whiskey and launched that in China and got to work with Dante Areola. We shot in Morocco for two weeks producing this crazy commercial um, for, um, for them. Um, we, we also pitched and won Sony Ericsson at the time and got to work with Garth Davies, a beautiful um, Australian director. And, and we shot in Melbourne, produced a beautiful little spot about one of their new feature phones. Um, and you know, they were just, I mean, just, I mean, I got to work on Guinness in Africa, which was great as well. So yeah, I mean, you know, there were there were some big clients and there were some big productions. I, you know, one of one of the most sort of 
interesting uh, projects I worked on. I, I, was, I sort of became a creative director on some of the P&G business, um, aerial washing powder. And it was sort of like, you know, I would go to these research groups and you would kind of, you would kind of sit there and you would listen to, um, you know, you listen to moms and women talk about the laundry and the burden of washing and all this kind of stuff. And I just, I just kind of felt like, you know, maybe there was an opportunity to try and do something different within this category. So I went and I pitched them some ideas about trying to look at taking mom out of the kitchen. You know, it was that traditional mom, you know, with the white, um, with the white t-shirt coming out of the, you know, I just, I just found it really derogatory and quite sort of uninspired. So we, we went and we pitched them this idea where we would try and take, take the laundry and take mom out of, out of the home and we produced some, some crazy um, spots about this Eskimo um, ice fishing, um, pulling sort of a baby grow out of a ice hole. Um, to demonstrate their, their cold wash uh, benefits, we, we shot um, some monks with their beautiful, um, uh, colourful robes um, to demonstrate the, the, the vibrancy of the colours. Um, so we kind of, we, cut, we got to sort of try and um, flip the traditional PNG way of thinking um, for a while and then obviously a new CMO came in and they went back to what they knew. So there was, you know, there was some, there was, I mean, I just loved, I just loved a lot of the, the, the opportunity I got in, in the UK. And I took, try to take advantage of the people, the place, the budget, and, and, and the ability to do work for big brands in a very big way. And, and that really was the antithesis of what I was doing at Jupiter um, in Cape Town. So I got to, you know, I always, I always feel like I got a really good schooling of, being nimble and being lo-fi and being pr having a problem-solving mentality at Jupiter, and then I feel like I got a really good grounding of how to um, take advantage of being able to use top directors with big budgets in in, in an environment like London at Saatchi and Saatchi. So uh, you know, I kind of I kind of feel like I got the best of both worlds. And then after that, I went to um, I joined the Wine R Network um, at Rainy Kelly Campbell Rolf Wine R. Um, and, I, and I was um, mostly on the Land Rover account globally, which was another big learning curve for me because it was about managing glo a global business. And, you know, there was the New York component was really big. The UK component was really big and China was starting to, you know, really get big for Land Rover. So it was, it was an interesting exercise in trying to orchestrate work through regions, work with teams on the ground, often having to spend quite a bit of time in those regions, working with agencies, working with clients to understand their problems and how to kind of roll the brand out through their markets. And that again was just a really good education on how to work with people and cultures and how to get the best out of uh, creative and the best out of clients and to really listen and understand. Because at the end of the day, I always feel like the, the problems are always the same. You know, like the, the, the truth is, is that no matter how different the region is, and, and whenever you speak to a CMO or a, or a creative agency, they always go, yeah, but you know, the problem in our region is X, Y, and Z. But actually, I think that the problems are, are kind of global. Surely, the, you know, sure, the insights are different, but in terms of... Um, but in terms of the business problems, the business problems are generally the same, you know, people, how do we get people to buy a luxury vehicle in a time where the economy is declining? Or how do we get people to buy a luxury vehicle where the, where the brand isn't as well known as the competitors, etc, etc. Um, so so the, the mission there was to try and figure out how to build, um, you know, a global toolkit for multiple markets and multiple regions. So, so again, there you had to really focus on the simplicity of the idea, because it had to resonate with maybe 10 or 12 different markets. So, so, so as much as you had sort of the global mandate and some nice budgets, you still had to be very simple in your thinking and you couldn't really rely on you know, the director to solve it or um, the photography to kind of make it look cool. You really had to find very, very strong insights um, in order to make the idea resonate with, like I said, 10, 10 or 12 different markets. And um, yeah, it was an amazing experience, um, absolutely brilliant. And I, you know, I was there for maybe just, just almost four years. And then I got offered the opportunity to come back here 
and run the region here, which I felt was like another, another stepping stone for me. And it's been an incredible journey. The last four years have been an absolutely incredible trip. Um, and, I've, and I've loved every single minute of it. So, yeah. For me, creative leadership is about two things. It's about leading by example. I think it's impossible to get people to follow you or to walk with you if you're not prepared to do the work yourself, if you're not prepared to live and breathe the very culture and the very ethics and ethos that you're preaching. So you've got to be in it. You can't helicopter creative direct. You can't just sit in your office with your feet up and you know, coordinate the troops. For me, it's about leading from the front um, and getting your hands dirty. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I think, I think my whole sort of style, my whole leadership style is really about proving and demonstrating that I'm willing to get as dirty as anyone in terms of the work, in terms of the late nights, in terms of the weekends, um, in terms of literally sat, sitting down and like cracking the work myself. I'm happy to get involved at, at any level. And I think that that's, so that's the first thing. I, th I, I think the second thing is trying to make people believe that they're better than they are. You know, and I think, I think that's an important thing because confidence is such a key thing in our industry. You know, creative people are quite, they're weird. You know, we built, we wired differently. I don't know what it is. Um, and some of the most talented and creative people just lack confidence. And I think you've got to inspire people. You've got to inspire people to think that they are capable of flying to the moon and beyond. And, and that isn't just about blowing smoke up someone's ass, that's by working with them and helping them to develop their skills and to, to, you know, to really develop their confidence. And that means sometimes you've got to push them. So sometimes you need to challenge. Sometimes you need to be tough. And other times you need to nurture at, at the same time. And I think that, that part for me, that balance, is something that I absolutely love doing. You know? um, I love being able to sit with a team, a young team, and help them get, get, their, you know, get, their, get their work into a space where they go, holy fuck, look at that, that's, that's incredible. You know, how do we do that? And, and that's one thing we really have done here in the Cape Town office. It's a very, very young studio. And we took on all these sort of rough diamonds. Um, most of them, some of them actually weren't even from traditional advertising schools and backgrounds. And we just kind of created this like studio of makers and doers and thinkers and designers and art directors and writers and who knows what, whatever else. And, and helping to mold their careers. And, and some of them have moved on and some of them have gone abroad. And it's just, you know, it's so gratifying to see that. So I think 2016 onwards is, I mean, it's, you know, I think our industry is always in so much flux. I think there's always some kind of a crisis but there's always an incredible opportunity at the same time. I think for, for our agency and the industry, I think, you know, I always believe that you have to have a little bit of a breakdown to have a breakthrough. And, and I think that's what's going on. I think that the traditional model is being broken down. And I think not just within traditional ATL agencies, I think a lot of digital agencies are also having a bit of a break, a breakdown in order to have a breakthrough. Um, I think, you know, I think that, I mean, for us personally, I really feel like Wine of Africa is going through a 2.0. I feel like the first four years were an incredible ride. And now we are really looking at ourselves and thinking, well, what kind of agency do we want to be going forward? And it's amazing. I mean, I love it. I love being in a, in a situation of stretch and a situation of everything being up in the air and the ability to remold and refigure. And I think that can be said for our industry as well. You know, the truth is, is that we should always be tinkering. And, and that's what really Andrew and myself have always been doing with, with, with my and Africa. We're always kind of like tinkering, like two mechanics in a, in a shed with, a, with, with like a Formula One car. You're constantly adapting and tinkering. And every now and again, you get to take the whole thing apart and look at what you don't need or look at what you need and then put it back together. And, and I think really the biggest thing for me is to not try and define who you are or what you do too much. Because the minute you try and define yourself, the industry would have moved on. Consumer habits would have changed. And I think that's the thing. 
So, you know, our clients and agencies are obsessed with creating, you know, the, what, what, is our, what is our agency model look like right now? Okay, here's our agency, here's the organogram, this is our services. I think trying to define yourself to, to you know, trying to define yourself to, um, to create a, a sort of a brand presence within the marketplace is dangerous. I, I don't think you should define yourself. Mm -hmm.